Good morning. Welcome to the March 2023 Environmental Essentials webinar brought to you by the Environmental Lands Resources Group at Bracewell. I'm Stephen Cook. I will be your guide as we take a walk through some of the recent events in East Palestine, Ohio. As I watched the news reports and read some of the documents that came out of this event, I started to have a number of questions. I was asking myself, gee, I hope the company was ready for this. Have they thought about that? Wow, that's kind of a curveball. I wonder how they're going to handle that. And so as the idea of a webinar on this topic came up, I thought, why don't we focus it on using this as a vehicle to allow us to better understand how we can be prepared for these types of events. So I titled this as Reflections from Afar. This is not a critique of the decisions that were made at the event. Those judgments will be made in the court of public opinion and court of law in the coming weeks, months, and years, but instead to use it as a vivid illustration of the types of challenges a company will face and they become involved in one of these events. And to use this as a vehicle to kind of assess whether your company's emergency operations plan, the training that you've done is sufficient and adequate given the world we live in today. So like all good legal things, it needs to have a disclaimer. So my discussion today will be based upon publicly available documents, whether they're government documents, press reports, media accounts, and such. At this time, I'm not aware of any client that we represent on this particular issue. Uh, so there's no inside baseball, but rather this is intended to be a time for you to reflect on your own company's um, preparation for one of these incidents and uh, perhaps identify ways you could improve or if you have gaps. So it's a little bit unique in that if I do my job right, you should end up with more questions and answers at the end of this. So let's get started. And so it begins. On the evening of February 3rd, a lengthy train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, near the Pennsylvania border. And I think if you've been watching the news at all, you know the event in detail. But the first thing that kind of struck me as I was watching this event unfold were the videos of the train prior to the actual derailment. And a couple of things popped into my mind. Well, one is, gee, where did they get those? Well, it turned out to be civilians' cameras, might be ring doorbells and such. But well, my first question for you is, has your plan contemplated how to gather evidence from these non-traditional sources? Do you go out on social media and grab the various pictures and videos that are posted, um, check for surveillance cameras along the route and such? Um, those are things that you need to think about now in the world we live in today. So that'd be my first question for you. Second is to even think about the role of social media itself. Have you thought through how you're going to deal with that? How are you going to try to control the narrative? What happens if disinformation shows up? How do you go about correcting that? Your employees are going to want to get involved in reviewing and commenting on the events. What guidance will you give them? That all should be part of your thought process and your training up front so that you're not first engaging on that particular topic in the heat of the event. The other thing that came to my mind is, gee, I hope this hasn't happened before. I, I hope the company has not had an incident prior to this with a similar failure mechanism. And they had a corrective action that they didn't actually follow through on. So my question for you to consider is, how are you doing on following through on your corrective actions that you found through various audits and incident investigations and such? Are you indeed getting those things done or do they keep getting delayed? Also ask you to think about looking at your corrective actions. If all your corrective actions are procedure-based or better training, perhaps you're not getting to the root cause of the events and not truly addressing the issues that need to be handled. So those are some of the things that came to mind just before the train even derails. Now we have the derailment and notifications get made. Some companies have the legal department in the middle of the notification. Others allow the technical folks to make those calls directly. Whatever your process is, are you sure that it will result in timely notifications made to all the entities that need it? There are those that are required by law, and events like this, you may think about going quite broad in your notifications because it's going to get a lot of publicity and everybody's going to want to know. So you need to think through not only your legal required notifications, but are there others that you might want to consider notifying given the scope and magnitude of the event? Then there's the incident command structure gets set up. You know, after the notifications, EPA will be on site within a couple hours with their on-scene coordinators. 
You also had the local emergency responders come in and a number of potentially large event, number of different agencies. How that incident command structure gets set up and how it works will look different depending upon where you are. If it happens in the chip channel, you're going to have a number of very efficient folks who have been through this many times. Out in a rural area, this may be the first time they've gone through one of these events. So you're training to prep your folks, both back at the home office as well as in the field, need to be able to address incident command structures that may look different, but should follow the same type of pattern. There's training available from various federal agencies, and when done well, the incident command structure is a tremendous vehicle for properly addressing these types of events, making good decisions, good flow of accurate information up and down the chain. When done poorly, it results in a lot of finger pointing and ultimately, oftentimes, bad decisions being made. And then finally, we come to the first of many, many communication challenges you will face in one of these events. The phrase I found interesting was controlled burn. One of your challenges in these types of events is to use terms that people hear and understand in the way in which you intend them. Now, the phrase controlled burn, if I'm talking to my in-laws who have a farm out in Idaho, to them, a controlled burn is many acres of land being, you know, burning the grass off or the wheat stubble. That's a controlled burn to them. If I talk to an engineer about controlled burn, it's usually in a box where you control temperature, pressure, residence time, and such. In this case, we were using controlled burn to describe a trench being dug, chemicals being released from tank cars into the trench, and then being burned in the open. So my question or query to you is, is your training thinking through these types of communication challenges? Have you thought about some of the key words you might use in one of these events that may be meaningful to you, but could be confusing to others who aren't used to it being used in those contexts. So it's a key part of your training, a key part of your thinking through emergency operations and response. Just ask you to think about your training protocols and if you've really covered that. There are a number of questions that come up during these events, and these are all questions that have come up at various times throughout this event. Um, when can I return to my home? That's a different way of phrasing, is it safe? And this is one of the most difficult messages to convey accurately and helpfully to a community. Uh, because the classic legal answer would be, well, it depends. Depends on where your home is. Depends on whether it was upgrading or downgrading it um, from the plume. Was it um, how close it was from that? Uh, how long have you been staying there? And just a whole host of factors that you need to think about. But you know you're going to get these kind of questions, so you need to at least have a framework about how you go through and thinking about this. And this is something that you need the agencies to also be working with you and responding to that, because when the public loses the trust of both the agency and the company, then it becomes very difficult to get anything productively done in a manner that um, helps move the process forward versus um, creating unnecessary friction and arguments. Now, I thought I'd, I'd read a document from you. This was a blog that was posted by an individual, and I'll tell you more about it in just to read it, but it, it thought it succinctly captures the problem you're facing. This individual wrote, the public correctly fears the unknown and the long-term latent impact of toxics. It should not be dismissed, but should be addressed and monitored. Toxic chemicals scare people, and government needs to respond to that sense of fear and apprehension. One would hope that over four decades later, the lessons of Love Canal and Superfund would be part of EPA's institutional lore. But four years of Trump and 40 years of anti-regulatory ideology have not done much to build the capacity of EPA to regulate, communicate, or respond to toxic disasters. This individual goes on and says that government wasn't trusted to Love Canal, wasn't trusted in Flint, Michigan, wasn't trusted in 9-11, um, which I must note, the Trump administration was not involved in any of those at the time that they happened. What's even more interesting, the individual who wrote this was actually in charge of developing the first communication strategy for the Superfund program and addressing this very issue. So you can see this has been a problem throughout the history of EPA and the ability to address this. 
some of the things that I learned from my time at EPA is that the need, as you go through this, you need to be truthful. You need to explain what you're going to do. You need to actually do it and then report back on what you've done, whether it's sampling results, whether it's cleanups, and whatever the particular issue is, those are three rules that are good to fall by. And I'd encourage you to think about, you know, how is your training? How's your program set up? Have you thought through those types of issues? Structure. Now, the specific facts will be different. You know, this being a rail car disaster in the rural, it looks different than if it was at a plant site along the ship channel. Your capabilities of your local responders are different. Uh, type of neighborhood you have nearby, the number of people you have nearby are very different in those settings. But you can get prepared with kind of the structure and how you would think about the issues and work through them, putting inserting the facts from your particular situation. So I'd ask you to think about your plans, the training you've done. Have you thought through those types of communication struggles and know what to do? Um, a classic question you get, um, would you drink the water? Um, I got asked this on a radio broadcast on this topic. And I said, well, I need more information before I'd answer that. Um, you know, if I, from a drinking water well that's a mile up gradient from the train derailment site, wouldn't have a problem. If it's from a well that's, you know, a shallow well that's, you know, 50 feet from where they dug the trench, may not do so. You know, so there are always a lot of factors that go into answering one of this. So, but you're developing some kind of generic response that you can then adapt to the facts that you're facing is critical, I think, for a good preparation. So I'd ask you to consider, have you thought through that? Do you have some basic responses put together that you can then insert facts for your particular situation? Um, why weren't we notified earlier? This is a common complaint. So I'd ask you to think about your training and your processes and your protocols. Are they in place to ensure timely notification it goes to not only those who are legally required, but who also probably should know? Local officials don't like to first hear about events on the news or in the reporter calls. They'd rather hear from the company whose event has created the issue so they can at least say they've been notified and are in communications. That's probably outside the scope of your typical, here's the legally required agencies I call. But it's a key consideration for you to think about. So I'd ask you to ponder, do you have that in your plans? Have you thought about asking that question when you have an incident like this, you trigger your emergency operations? Are you thinking about, do we need to make a broader based notification than what the law requires us? How long will you stay? Will you pay my medical bills for 20 years from now are, are common questions you will hear when you have this kind of exposure in an incident. So the questions that came to my mind as I hear this is, what planning have you done with your insurance carriers? Have you talked through how they would help you respond to a community? Have you thought through what kind of coverage you ought to have? What kind of risk are you facing? Uh, those are important for you to be able to accurately respond to these types of questions that you're going to get from the community. Let's spend a few minutes talking about just within the company itself. Uh, these types of events, you're going to have some type of presence at site. Obviously, if it's at a plant site, um, you've got personnel there all the time. You have employees you have to deal with. Has your training, has your preparation thought through exactly how you would go about being present at the site, whether it's your own property? or if it's remote. That's a critical aspect of building trust with the community where this event has occurred, is what your presence looks like, how easy it is for them to access, get information. So a little work done beforehand to at least think about the structure, the types of responses you can provide, the types of resources you'd be willing to provide. And this gets to a point of also, what is the role of the legal department? In one of my prior lives, when I was on our, the emergency operations group and we'd go through tabletops, what I found interesting is a lot of the questions that came up really weren't environmental. It was a clear environmental impact event. But 
The questions really are about um, liability waivers or impacts on customers, suppliers. They're contractual. Do we have contracts in place to get the resources out there to accomplish whatever it is, whether it's cleanup, whether it's medical monitoring, um, whatever the needs are, what our contracts are in place. So there's a lot of contract law, commercial law, if you will, um, as opposed to just environmental law, even when it's a huge environmental event. So you need to think about exactly which lawyers do you have engaged on the event? Have you thought that through? And do you have the right resources in the right room? Do you really want people signing liability waivers right off the bat? Um, you heard stories coming out from this event of people who were simply wanting their drinking water monitored in their house, the air in their house monitored, and they felt like they were getting, you know, asked to sign away all their rights and whatever liability waivers. Once again, a reminder, I'm basing this based on what I've heard in the press. I have no idea if these things are actually did occur or not, but it isn't what it triggered in my mind is, have you thought through, are you going to ask people to sign those kind of documents? Some companies, if there's are significant injuries or, you know, unfortunately, fatalities, uh, will just give money to the families to address, take the immediate cash needs off the table and won't even ask for any anything to be signed. You know, maybe an acknowledgement that they got the money, but there's no waiver, there's no legal ease, just simply you take immediate cash flow off the table for those who have been devastated by such an incident. Uh, and so that's something that you need to think through. And so my question for you, have, have you done that? Have you at the company thought through how you might um, respond to those types of things? The role of the CEO. Um, in one of my prior lives in one incident um, had a CEO who had actually worked at the facility where the incident occurred. And part of the role of, I think, the legal department plays is make sure everybody plays the roles that they've been assigned. And occasionally we had to remind the CEO that uh, we had a highly qualified plant manager, engineers, all working to address the impact at the site and to deal with getting the plant back up and running. And now the role for the CEO, who could draw on his wealth and background of having worked at the plant, was to deal with shareholders, with the public, with potentially politicians and those types of things. So making sure that the executives understand their roles in these types of incidents and prepping them for when they may have to go. In this case, um, the Norfolk Southern CEO has been in front of Congress. He's been in the community. Um, those may not be locations and public meetings that they are used to. So there's a lot of prep work that goes into that. And so my question for you to consider, have you thought that through? Do you know who you would call to help you with that prep work? Um, do you want to do a little bit of that beforehand? It's just part of the generalized training and and base support that you give to the senior executives so that they can be prepared should this happen. Because when these things happen, time can move very quickly and events can change quickly. You also have a lot of impact to customers and suppliers. You're going to get a lot of questions about, does this event mean you can't deliver my product to me next week? Or suppliers, um, do I still ship? What do I do? Do I declare force majeure? There's a number of those types of ongoing issues that you need to work through. So part of your plan should be thinking about how you would get the right people together to talk that through and figure out how you're going to deal with the economic side of the event and who you want in the room for those discussions. You know, obviously the exact person you need probably depends on, you know, the type of, you know, which business line is actually impacted by the event and such, but you can set up kind of a base structure and give them a type of questions they need to be asking to work through and then hand that to the folks who actually get called in. Or you can do tabletops with that. And that may be something you think about. Rather than full-blown tabletops, maybe you do smaller tabletops where you just look at the business side and get a several different business managers in and just kind of spend a little time walking through the types of questions they would get, what things that you'd want to get through, because that may spur some ideas about how you want contracts to be structured. Um, and when you have these types of events, whether it's indemnities or ability to say force majeure or the ability to adjust based upon what happens in, in a particular event. These are all things you can spend some time doing some work on. So I'd ask you to just think about those things. Think about what you've seen in Ohio and are you as prepared as you can be? 
or are there areas that you might want to improve on? Let's talk a little bit about the legal and political fallout. Uh, when you have an event like this, the, the lawyers and the government agencies will be there. Um, in one article I saw, I think I counted up a, like almost a dozen different agencies involved in the incident command post at one time. So you're going to have local, state, federal, lots of interest, lots of assistance. You need to be able to think through how you address that. You also will get some curveballs thrown. Um, you don't always get an EPA unilateral order, but that is a scenario that can happen to you. So that's one of those that you can think through calmly now. You know, what resources would you want to have that? How would you make that decision, whether you're going to comply with it or not? Who might you call? Get those set up so that when you're under this under the gun on this, and they gave Norfolk Southern 24 hours to respond, you have the people you need identified and can convene that group to have that discussion. The Ohio Attorney General has filed a lawsuit, and they aren't the only ones. There's also, last count I saw was 19 class actions over this event. But this is going to bring to you questions such as preservation of evidence. Uh, also, um, anything you say throughout this event can and will be used against you. And so you need to be thinking through all your actions, all your communications in a way that addresses these future liabilities. And so my question to the audience is, have you thought through as a company how you would deal with these? Have you identified the resources you want in the early days of these? Have you thought through how you would go about approaching um, ability to get things moving again at a site? Now with the, the railroad, there's probably other lines you can go around and still get product delivered. But if this is at a plant site and you've lost production for quite a while, um, having it you know tied up for six months and in preliminary injunctions and inability to move things while evidence is collected and plaintiff's lawyers get to crawl all over it, you need to think about what are your defenses? How can you move it along so you can get back to repair and reopening? Another interesting thing, if you look at um, some of the events there in Ohio, is the role of um, NGOs and the community. Um, we live in a world now where information is so easily accessible, and it's frankly impressive. A number of the statements coming from whether it's individuals of the community or NGOs that are very detailed on the science of these different chemicals of the products of combustion from the burn, from the potential long-term impacts of these exposures, as well as their access to information on the history of the company, prior railroad accidents, whether it was Norfolk Southern or others, or similar releases of vinyl chloride and burning that's occurred um, throughout the world. We have to understand now that uh, that whole network of NGOs and such is interconnected with other groups around the globe and have access to information, all sorts of information and resources. They have the funds available and the technical resources to be very good at raising the issues in a way that frames them up for their point of view. So the question for you to ponder is, have you thought through how that might impact the way you respond, the preparation you need to do, the way you think about communications? Uh, given the fact that the community is going to be not lacking for resources at times. And the final comment up here is um, the quote here, and I, I think this is one I actually kind of made up, but, and this deals with the waste disposal, you know, but they have a permit. This, I'm allowed to send this material to them. Why can't I? And you're going to face some of that. These large events Political dynamics start occurring. If you look at the EPA unilateral order, they have to do a special notification to the state that the waste is going there as part of getting EPA's approval to be able to ship it to a site. Um, these, um, in this particular case, these concerns were not necessarily well-founded, but they were real concerns. Uh, 
the deep well in Texas that the material was headed to. Lots of things go down that deep well and lots worse things than what was coming from Ohio have gone down that deep well. But because of the publicity that attached to this, concerns are raised by local officials. So for those of you who are in the waste handling business, um, watching this, this has impact on your business. And that's something to think about as you think about the, your planning and your focus about dealing with the event. There are collateral issues that rise up, impact you. You know, the rail car may or may not be the railroads. You know, whoever lease is in, owns that rail car, decisions are being made, or whoever owns the chemicals, decisions are being made by people who may not own the rail car or own the chemicals about what's going to happen and create a liability for you. And if you thought through what that scenario looks like, you know, the contracts and the way you like them set up to deal with those types of issues with regards to indemnities or ability to influence decisions and such. So there's a whole host of issues that are out there. So to wrap this up, what I like to kind of go back to how I started is that this was not intended as a comprehensive review of everything that's happened in East Palestine over the last few weeks, but just highlight a few of the interesting things that I saw and caused me to reflect on the preparation that I had gone through in my prior lives and to get you to think about the preparation you've done at your company, the way you've gone about your training, the issues you've thought about, the emergency plans you put in place, the resources you have under contract or contingent contracts. We just wanted to use this time to get you to think about responding to this type of crisis and recognize that it can take lots of interesting twists and turns, ones that are not typical and probably ones you can't anticipate. But the more thought you've put into your base preparation and structure of your organization and responses, and particularly on the communications, you will have um, done yourself a great service in your ability to help your company respond to these types of events and to recover. So with that, we appreciate you taking the time this morning to be with us. I encourage you to join us next month for the next Environmental Essentials webinar. And also, please mark your calendars um, for the next um, Environmental Lands and Resources um, Environmental Law Seminar. This will be our spring 2023 edition. It's on May 9th in Houston. So we encourage you to mark that on your calendar. You'll be getting a notice in the coming weeks about with more details about the content and logistics and such. And we'd love to have you there in person so we get a chance to talk with you and meet with you about um, issues that may concern you. And finally, with regards to this particular webinar, here's my contact information. Um, everything's on the Bracewell website as well. So if, whether it's myself or your regular contact here at, at Bracewell, We've all talked through and thought about these things, but to close this up, I encourage you once again, think about your organization, your preparation, the training you've done for these types of events, given what you've seen in Ohio and other recent events. Are you as prepared as you can be? Are there things you might want to adjust to improve on or add to focus on as part of your preparation? So with that, I hope that you don't have to go through this in your career, but if you do, Hope that you're prepared and we're here to help you if you need it. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day.